welcome to UGA Sports Rumors versus Facts. I am Blaine Gilmer here once again with Trent Smallwood and Jed May as we come to you talking about an in-depth breakdown of Will Smith smacking the ever. No, I'm just kidding. That's not that's not what's going to be the topic of discussion tonight. Although uh, although I'm sure we could uh, get some mileage out of that here this weekend, guys. Uh, a little physicality breaking out on the on the Oscars, and uh, I'm sure that. Uh, the Georgia coaching staff is looking for some guys. They're going to bring some physicality here uh, to Athens pretty soon, and that's some of these guys that were on these recruiting visits this weekend. So uh, we'll, I'm sure we're going to get into all those guys. But first of all, how are both of you guys doing? Oh, good weekend covering covering recruiting, getting caught up. Trent, you have any baseball this weekend? What's going on? Yeah, we played a little bit of baseball this weekend. Didn't do good, so now we'll stop there. So. <laughs> He's like, that's enough of that. Jed, uh, Jed, how was this weekend, man? Good. I took a family trip up to Helen, played some golf. Uh, you know, just kind of made a low country boil Saturday night that uh, worked out really well. So, good weekend all around in between the Tex and the Tex and the youngins. No doubt, no doubt. And there was a there was a lot of a lot going on in terms of recruiting for the University of Georgia. Some major prospects in Richard Young, one of the most talented running backs in all of the country, uh, comes in, you know, from from Florida and is making a hit. I think his third trip to Athens. He's been up there several times, third or fourth trip. Um, and this one, of course, now that he's a class 2023 20, guy and, and and the senior year is approaching, much more crucial with uh, him being on campus this late in the game. Jamal Jarrett is a guy who you and I saw, Jed, up at the Rivals Charlotte camp and has completely transformed his body. I mean, he's just uh, really grown and filled out a good bit. And then, of course, right, wide receiver like Tyler Williams and uh, Hakeem Williams, the Williams and Williams in town in Athens. So a lot to break down here. But, uh, Trent, we'll, we'll kind of start with you. Anything – before we get to questions and all this other stuff, anything that just kind of caught your eye or, or or caught your attention from the recruiting weekend that was for the University of Georgia? Yeah, I mean, you look back, I mean, several years ago when Jordan Davis was a highly tied recruit, he was in a similar situation as far as ranking-wise uh, as uh, Jared is. And, and everything that I've heard from the staff is how much of a priority he is. And, you know, you look at him, five seven three star – which was similar. I think I think Davis might have been a five eight four star, but not ranked. But uh, a lot of similarities in their recruitment as far as uh, um, not highly touted, but very sought after. Um, and and I know Georgia, you see at UGA Sports dot com. He wrote, you know, you you wrote the article. They wrote up uh, rolled out the red carpet for him, and and he's a he's a major priority. I've heard uh, you know just stuff from the about, from the staff about how how much of a priority he is. Uh, and you know, it's you, you look at that guy, and, and if you get him on board, I think his ranking's going to go up. But I also think he's a, a high ceiling guy that uh, Trey Scott would love to get his hands on. Jed, you know, in terms of what you saw out of Jamal there at the camp, uh, obviously what Trent's saying, high could be a high ceiling guy, but just physically, kind of tell people what what you saw while we were there in Charlotte out of out of Jamal. Dude's big. Um, he measured in at, I want to say he was, I can't remember, like maybe 6'3", six, 6'4", uh, six, but he, I remember 353 pounds, um, and he weighed it on the sheet. He, you know, we could, he could blow through guys. He obviously bowled right over guys, you know, getting to the quarterback in those one-on-one drills. So a very, 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 very impressive guy. He's got probably what, nine months, or I don't know if he's enrolling early or not, but he's got a while still to grow and develop and, and keep fine-tuning his body. So he was another one of those guys. And it's interesting because the Jordan Davis comparison is obviously is the obvious one there, but there's the Travis Shaw comparison as well out of the same high school at Grimsley um, yeah. in North Carolina, another guy that's just a highly touted guy in that 22 class. So definitely got some, um, you know, there, there's some pretty obvious comparisons there. And right now he looks like a guy that could grow and develop and, and be the next great defensive lineman out of that area. And, and Jed, we won't uh, name names, but there was some people uh, that – knew football very well at that camp and they even said that uh, at this point in their career and development that Jamal Jarrett maybe even be ahead of Travis Shaw in their opinion right. so that yeah. is a very very high praise um for the defensive tackle 
out of Greensboro, North Carolina. So that is definitely something to keep an eye on there when it comes to Jamal Jett. He told me that if he were to drop a, 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 a top three today, Georgia would solidly be in it. Of course, North Carolina, and then you have to kind of decide on the on the third one there. So it's Georgia, North Carolina right now battling things out for Jamal Jarrett. Um, at one point, I mean, it's, it, it's very interesting to see. He's gone from a guy who was more of a project development type offensive lineman prospect to now a dominant defensive tackle, uh, defensive tackle, nose guard type prospect. So that's, uh, something, something to keep, keep an eye on there. And also, of course, you know, come, this first week in April upcoming, what we're talking about here with the NFL draft, it's going to be another big push here for Georgia recruiting because they're going to see a lot of these defensive linemen go off the board very, very early. Uh, and it's going to just put more fresh uh, Georgia propaganda, so to speak, in these recruits mind by all these uh, dollar signs and high draft picks that Georgia, former Georgia players are going to be pulling in. Now, in terms of the running back position, um, Richard Young did come this weekend, like we said, once again, coming up from, from Florida, uh, five-star running back that is just – he's been – he's looked like a five-star to me since I first saw him as a freshman play. Like, he, he's just so physical. We talked about that physicality earlier that Georgia likes in their program. Richard Young plays with that physicality. He's a, he's a big running back. When he took that picture – uh, and posted it for Georgia this week, and he posted the picture of his visit. Trent, it looked to me like – I mean, I've not seen a, a running back that looks that physically imposing since, like, Derrick Henry. Like, he's like that – he's not that size, but that's what it looked like when it uh, when he was taking that picture. He's very well put together. Yeah, and Branson Robinson's put together, but he's also on the shorter end. You yeah, he's tall. That, that, Richard's you tall. Tall, uh, lengthy running backs that are built like him. Yeah, Derrick Henry is a very good – uh, similarity but uh yeah he he definitely um uh, he's got the length and the size uh i mean i guess you would say more like a i mean todd Gurley wasn't as built up as a, uh but he had kind of like that uh the size frame as Gurley, but a little bit more <laughs> built up at the at that point in his uh, career yeah i mean he's he's listed at six one on rivals i think he could be closer to six two i mean this young man is uh this young man is is it Got that size, like you said, and the, the breakaway speed is there, the vision. Um, Jed, it, it looks like right now, if you had to if you had to throw a bet down on it, if you had to to you know stake your claim of the two running backs that are gonna be in this class, it looks like Justice Haynes and, and Richard Young are the two that that are out in front, at least in terms of who Georgia wants to end up in this class. I know Reuben Owens is there as well, but I think those two are kind of the leaders in the clubhouse, so to speak. Yeah, and it's interesting because that number two spot, I mean, it seems like for a while Georgia has led for Justice Haynes. It seems like Justice Haynes will end up. Um, a Bulldog, obviously a long way to go there too, but for a while it looked like it'd be Trayon Webb. Trayon Webb actually was committed at one point, of course, and then then it's kind of seemed like it was Ruben Owens, and now it's kind of seemed like Richard Young. So it seems like, not that the staff isn't isn't prioritizing all those guys, but it kind of seems like the interest level is is varying with those guys. So there's those three. There's, um, there's Cedric Baxter as well. Um, so Jamar and, Wil Jamar and Wilcox out of South Baldwin. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's still, it's going to be very interesting to see how, um, that second running back spot develops over this class, just with so many names in the mix and the interest level, you know, kind of varying, um, you know, going up and down with all those guys over the course of, uh, the next few weeks and months. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk to people around the university of Georgia about the running backs and how they're used and things like that, you just see the, the, model that Georgia's using is what works in lockstep with what the NFL uses now. It's not too many carries. They're get they're finding ways, even with Zamir White. Think how many times out of the backfield uh this year Zamir White caught a pass and it maybe caught you off guard if you weren't paying close attention. You're like, oh hey Zeus is out there, you know, catching a ball in the flat or a swing route or something like that. Georgia uses the backs very in a very versatile manner. They have to learn pass protection. Uh, very well. I mean, James Cook was the one that cut the guy down on A.D. Mitchell's, uh, uh, you know, important touchdown in the national championship game. So, you know, they're they're selling these running backs that they're going to become a complete back if they come to University of Georgia. And they're going to have a lot of tread on the tires when it comes time to go to the NFL, because, you know, I heard someone say that uh, every every 
carry you take in the SEC and in the NFL is like a day off your life. Like that's that's how that's how uh, that's how brutal it is and physical in, in that kind of game. So Richard Young definitely has the the capability to withstand that beating. You would think with uh, with his his stature and he's definitely kind of priority one B if, if, if justice Haynes is one a for the university of Georgia there, and that could even be vice versa. So, but running back wasn't the only position that was heavily, you know, scrutinized this weekend. Also wide receiver is somewhere, you know, everything goes in cycles, Trent. And it seems like the offensive weapons the offensive weapons are what Georgia's really going to have to hone in on this class. Last class was more defensive laden, trying to replenish all these guys that are going to the league. But I think it'll be time for to rack up on some uh, wide receivers because Georgia doesn't have a lot in terms of numbers right now at wide receiver. Yeah, and Kirby Smart has expressed that. And I think, um, you know, as far as playmakers, I think they got playmakers at running back. I think they got playmakers that uh, tied in it's strictly, you know, that wide receiver position that they need to, uh, you know, not only uh, get some high-quality guys, but they need uh, a lot of guys. And uh, I think you're going to need at least four or five guys in this class, um, you know, to, to make the numbers right come uh, after after this coming fall. So, uh, yeah, definitely. I, th- I think they need, you know, uh, two or three high-quality guys, but I, they, they, they need a couple more just number-wise just to, you know, be able to, practice two or three teams uh, uh, at wide receiver. But, yeah, I mean, there's some high-quality guys in this class. There's some guys with, with a lot of up, upside. Um, and then there's guys like Hakeem Williams who can, uh, you know, do it all at, at the receiver position. He was on campus this weekend. So, um, uh, he, he's a big target for Georgia. And uh, I, I like where Georgia stands with Brian McClendon and that relationship right now. So many new names, too, Jed, have come kind of squarely into the wide receiver conversation for Georgia with the addition of uh, Brian McClendon. Uh, you know, it seems like Rico Flores is a guy that that has come into the fold recently. Things are getting more serious with Devin Hyatt. Um, you know, Bryson Rogers is a guy that I wrote about not too long ago. It just seems like more and more new names. Aiden Mizell. I mean, there's been a lot of new names that have come under, into the picture, and that's either because – you know, all these guys seem to tell us, oh, well, Brian McClendon was talking to me at, at Oregon or he was talking to me at Miami. So I think that hire alone has increased the scope of Georgia's wide receiver recruiting in this class. Yeah, and, and that happens with position coaches. We've seen the same thing on the other side of the ball with uh, Fran Brown as well. All the, A, the offers that have been going out to guys up there and guys that have come down on visits like uh, Ellis Robinson was down here last weekend. Uh, William Love was on a visit and earned an offer. Um, so that and it was a Deribe, same thing. Yeah, we, right, remember we we talked a few weeks ago. As soon as he got the job, all these offers started going out to these long, you know, six four, two hundred twenty five pound uh, edge rusher guys. So it's one of those things where obviously it's it's Kirby Smart's team, it's his vision, it's his you know he's signing off on these things. But the position coaches one have those existing relationships, and two you know they put their own stamp on what kind of guys they're looking for and what kind of guys they want to bring into Athens and. Uh, you know, mold into these future starters and NFL players. No doubt, no doubt. And we're going to have more on that when we get to our questions. Real quick, if you haven't already, go ahead and do us a favor. Hit that like button on the YouTube uh, feed here and also subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, that helps us out a lot. It's free to do. You just hit that red subscribe button right there and it would greatly help us out. We also have the show available the next day on the audio anywhere you get audio uh, podcast, you can you can get it there from the UGA Sports um, podcast feed. So uh, make sure to do all that for us. You can see the Twitter uh, UGA Sports com Twitter feed there as well. Uh, give that a follow. Greatly appreciated for all that. So you know, big in the class of 2023. Of course, there's 2024s and 2025s rolling in. Georgia's taking full advantage of this opportunity to let people see how they operate. And that's something that these players really, really seem to enjoy, Trent, is they get to kind of see behind the curtain and see how these Georgia coaches are going to potentially treat them if they uh, end up, you know, coming to Athens. So they get to see them kind of in the, in the heat of battle uh, coaching through those players. 
I know specifically Tyler Williams mentioned to me that he loved how involved Kirby Smart was in all aspects of practice, and you know that's something that that uh, Arch Manning's head coach has also said that Arch loves about the Georgia program. I, th- I know some people uh, kind of have mixed feelings sometimes about how maybe Kirby has his fingers in every little part of the of the operation there, but I feel like that ends up being a big selling point when it comes to the recruiting trail that, that the head coach is going to be involved somewhere or another. And you're, he's not just a CEO there watching it all take place. Yeah. And that's where we've kind of talked about the stability. Um, I mean, they're going to, they're going to be involved everywhere and, and a good head coach is going to be involved everywhere. You, there's a difference between being involved everywhere and letting your coaches coach. I think you uh, definitely in practice, you have to be involved. You have to be involved and in, in, in on the offense side of the ball, defense side of the ball, get get things uh you know build that expectation there uh, of what they want but then when it gets game time you know letting the letting your coaches do your thing is also important but yeah like you said uh these these young guys being able to see these uh new assistants uh working and then also you know kirby having his hands in on everything just just uh working it's big it's big for these players to be able to get on campus. And it's kind of what they missed during that COVID year, but having that opportunity to get these kids on campus and showing uh, kind of the on-field aspects of, of what to expect when they get to that level. Um, and that's a big, that's a big selling point in, in Georgia's recruiting. No doubt. There's a lot of you guys in here right now uh, watching us live. Go ahead and put in some comments if you want to. We'll get to those after we answer the vault questions. And I may even, if it's relevant, I may even sprinkle one in every now and then. So go ahead and fill up those comments on YouTube. We'll start uh, putting those up on the screen as we get time here. But without further ado, let's go ahead and hit our questions from the vault. Uh, UGA sports vault members get to get their questions answered first so jed uh, green timber kicks us off here yeah how are we looking at inside linebacker for the cycle i know about troy bolds and cj allen but who else are we looking at for that spot yeah i think some guys that at least are firmly on the radar would be um you know raylan wilson uh who they're they're still working to flip from michigan uh, would would be a guy on there, Raul Aguirre, who's an in-state, um, you know, in-state prospect at, out of Fayetteville, Georgia, over at Whitewater High School. I know he got an offer from Florida today, and his recruitment is is uh, taking off tremendously. That's another one there. And, and then Whit Weeks is a guy who I think most people expect with his brother having transferred to LSU to end up at LSU, but he is an Oconee County uh, high school guy and someone that Georgia is at least going to attempt to to get on campus one more time uh, if, if he doesn't already commit to LSU before then. But I think that's kind of the main gist of the the inside linebackers. I mean, is there anybody else that I'm leaving off that 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 may have a shot at inside linebacker? I know like they mentioned C.J. Allen. Um, can't really think of any other guys, so to speak, at, at this moment in time. But, Jed, uh, what was kind of your feeling with, uh, you know, Raylan Wilson? We touched on it a little bit last week. Um Michigan, he committed to Michigan early, but Georgia's always been heavily involved there. Yeah, I definitely think Georgia is – well, it's easy for me to say because Georgia was in his top two when he committed to Michigan, but I think Georgia is that school that if he backs off that Michigan pledge, is going to end up in Athens. He's got a close relationship with Glenn Schumann. Um, Schumann actually visited his school down in Tallahassee in January right after he committed to Michigan. Um, and then obviously Waylon uh, came back up here I believe, last weekend. So – Definitely a name to keep an eye on there. There's obviously our role, Aguirre and, and Blaine. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've talked with them a lot. Are they looking at Quay Russo for inside, or is he more of an edge guy? He, well, they were uh, looking at him. They said, yeah, inside linebackers where they where they want him to be. But then now since uh, Coach Uzo Deribe has come on board, there's been a switch. You know, Dan Landon no longer yeah. the coordinator, uh, switch in philosophy. I think Uzo Deribe kind of stood on the table and said, "Oh, I want, I want Russo. I, I want, I want him." So he's, uh, he's. I think they're recruiting him as the edge guy a little bit more now. But um, we'll see, we'll see about that. Uh, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be very interesting to see how that all uh, works out. But great question, uh, Green Timber. All right, next question, Jed. Just John four nineteen feels like this twenty three class needs to be offense heavy. Who are the key receivers we're focused on, and how many will we take? Trent, how many do you think they take in the class for wide receivers? Um, I, I'm thinking five. 
I, yeah, I it's going to be a load up situation, that. in my opinion. Um, I got four listed on the clash prediction, I believe, but I, I would say it's leaning towards five with that with the numbers they need and the and the guys that will be departing after this year. I think five's a safe bet. And another and another point is too, uh, people need to realize that Pierce Sperlin and I keep telling people this is different than any other. I know Brock Bowers just had an unbelievable freshman year, but Pierce Sperlin's a different tight end than Georgia's ever brought in over there with maybe the exception of uh, Eric Gilbert, who is working his way back and has yet to play for Georgia. But I think you're going to see a situation where Pierce Sperlin could line up as an, as an X and not skip a beat in, in a lot of Georgia's personnel packages because he's that talented as a route runner. He's that gifted um, with the ball in the air with his body control. So, Trent, that may give him some flexibility there at the wide receiver position or even the tight end position if they – depending on how they want to def- define him going forward. Yeah, I think he's a guy that can line up wide receiver. I think it's similar to uh, Eric Gilbert. Um, he can line up out there. Brock Bowers can line up out there. I think they just got versatile tight ends now that can really do it all. And and, and going back to the uh, the running backs that you were talking about, how, they, how Georgia used the running backs – they're not scared to flex those guys out either, um, you know. So we, we've seen that with James Cook. We've seen that with Kenny Kenny McIntosh. So you know, talking about utilizing uh, utilizing the running backs there, they utilize the tight ends in a similar situation. They're not strictly uh, in line tight ends. That they're, they're like to the, uh, you know get the tight ends out in space. And I think Munkin's done a good job of, of utilizing those guys. As far as the um, and I'll throw the question back up again. As far as the ones that they're heavily focused on. I know that we've said Hakeem, Hakeem Williams is, is probably number one overall. I mean, obviously they have Raymond Cottrell already committed, so they're going to look to keep him in the class. But Hakeem Williams is there. I know that, that, that Tyler Williams that they just had on, that's a, he's a four-star prospect as well. Caden Lee is a guy who would be more of that slot fit who they've been recruiting for a long time and, and is maybe one of the better ones in the state of Georgia – uh, that that Georgia's after. I mean, is there anybody that that uh, other? I mean, Jalen Hale is a guy you got to kind of wait and see what happens with with Arch Manning there uh, too, because Arch Manning Jed is going to have a big impact on a lot of how these, uh, depending on where he ends up, is going to have a big impact on a lot of where these wide receivers are thinking about going. In my own opinion, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Which you know, it's just that's going to be the nature of the game and people are going to keep asking these questions throughout the summer of recruit or receiver recruiting, receiver recruiting, but with Arch Manning not deciding until, I mean, what late, late summer, early fall, maybe around the start of the high school season, it's just, it's going to take uh, some and, time for that domino to fall. The, his head coach said in the piece uh, today, I don't remember which uh, rivals national columnist wrote it, but he was talking to Nelson Stewart once again, after this latest round of, uh, of visits from March Manning. And they said, honestly, this family could wait until December to, to make a, to make an announcement. So I don't think there's any rush with the Manning family whatsoever. Um, But I wanted to throw one more guy in there. Uh, Braylon James is a guy out of um, Duval high school in in Texas. That is uh, someone that, that Todd Munkin and Kirby smart, you know, took time to go out there and visit the uh, coach Acosta, the the head coach out there at Duvall is, is um, the former head coach at IMG Academy on the, on the, uh, you know, national team, the travel team. So he knows a uh, good ball and he has a good connection with Kirby Smart and Todd Munkin. So they went out there to see him and uh, Brandon James has Georgia listed high in his, um, his selection, his recruiting right now as well. So we will uh, we'll we'll, we'll kind of wait and see on the receivers fully until we see what happens with Arch Manning because I think that's going to dictate a lot of this. And of course, Brandon Ennis is out there as well. We can't let that go without. Now it does look like maybe the momentum is not as high as it was when uh, Brian McClendon first came on with Brandon Ennis, but uh, still a lot to a long time to go in that recruitment as well. New uh, a, a new questioner here, Jed. I haven't seen uh, Doctor Diggler yet, but uh, he's got a question for us. Yeah, I feel like I would remember that name if I had seen it. So welcome to the welcome to the party, pal. Um, how do the cornerbacks that Georgia is currently after stack up against the defensive back hall from the 22 class? Where would you rank Tony Mitchell, Kamani McLean, and AJ Harris if they came out in the 22 class? 
I may be totally wrong. I don't think there's going to be any class that stacks up to the <laughs> class that Georgia just hauled in. I mean, you hauled in guys that I think legitimately every guy Georgia brought in in this class of 2022 will realistically hear their name called in the you know first, second day of the NFL draft when their time comes, Trent. Yeah. Um, yeah, that defensive back class is, is guys that could come in and, um, you know, play – play early and then you got your edge guy i mean that georgia's whole defensive i mean th th this is similar to that uh th that class back when with roquan and all them guys i mean you got guys that are just uh you know probably ready to play day one might not play day one just because of the overall uh, mentality of the sec uh but uh, i mean you got some dogs in this class and, and it'll be it, they'll be fun to watch as they develop in athens uh throughout the next three years if you guys were ranking Tony Mitchell, McLean, uh, Kamani McLean, and AJ Harris in the class of 2022, I think all those guys are tremendous players. But I just don't, I don't think they would stack up very well with, uh, you know, in terms of the the guys that were in that 2022. It, it'd be they would certainly wouldn't be ranked ahead of them, in my opinion. They could be closer out right there with them in some situations, but. I like those guys, uh, the the Dalen Everett's of the world, the Jaheim Singletary's of the world. I mean, those are guys that, like I said, they could find their way onto the field this year for Georgia. That's hard to compete with. Yeah, it, it'll be. Uh, I mean, that that one year makes a difference. I mean, you you know, uh, you, you see, um, just guys that have reclassified. It, it's hard. I mean, that one year makes a a, a big difference, and and you know, evaluating those guys as twenty two guys is kind of tough because they got a whole another year and a half in high school. Um, so, um, it, it's tough to do that. But but at the same time, I think Georgia's the the few guys Georgia brought in defensive back, you know, Malachi Starks and and those guys that they're they're tough. It would be tough to compete with them if you're putting them head to head at this moment in time. No, no doubt, and I think that's. Uh, one thing you talk about reclassify, I'm going to diverge for a minute. That's what makes the LT Overton situation so complex there, Jed, because one, he's been injured for uh, for a good portion of his high school career. He's had to fluctuate his weight because of basketball back and forth, and now to skip a whole year of development, I don't care how cognitively and emotionally uh, you, know, you may be developed and, and ready for, for college – I think reality, you know, hits you in the face a little bit when you make that jump. And I, I just that's why I'm so unsure about, you know, if I was a in the position of recruiting in Georgia, do I push all my chips to the table to say, hey, we got to land LT Overton? Complex is a good word uh, to describe that recruitment, because it's like you said, like Trent just said, it's so hard to compare these guys in the 23 class to the guys we watch in the 22 class because they're year less developed, advanced, whatever. And then you got LT Overton who, and this isn't picking on him. It's anybody because you got these guys on campus who should be high school junior or high school seniors, excuse me. So you're probably not physically ready to play year one, maybe physically ready to play year two. And then, then I don't know. It's just, a, you know, you've wasted or not wasted, but that's, that's two years of eligibility that are, are theoretically gone. Whereas you could have spent another year in high school, just growing and, it's just it's just a year of growth, right? I mean, it doesn't yeah. really matter whether it's the college coaching or not. It's just the fact that it's another 365 days to get bigger and and um, all that kind of stuff. So, and the the counter, so. yeah, the counter to that is people are going to say, well, if you need rehab and you need physical development, then True. why not go to a, a college program and things like that? And then also the other caveat there is the NIL now, Trent. I mean, people are going to say, well, if you're being have an opportunity to, to make potentially life changing money, you know, going into that kind of deal, then that's something that has to be considered. And it absolutely does. I just, uh, I don't know, I'm a little more old school when it comes to to that approach and. Would like to see kids uh, finish it out, um, finish out the high school high school journey because I think uh, you know you hear some guys that are former NFL players say there's nothing like playing on those Friday nights. Like you don't you just you just don't uh, forget those kind of deals. So very uh, very curious to see how all this plays out a couple years from now. The transfer portal is a big deal. So mm -hmm. who knows where all these guys that end up reclassifying? But I do know one thing, Trent that the Tony Grimes of the world are few and far between. 
Yeah, it, you talk about wasting that year of, uh, you know, losing that year of high school, but you're, I feel like you're, most guys are losing a year of college too because you're, you're, you're losing your senior year of high school, but I think you're also losing your freshman year because you're more than likely not going to play as a freshman if you're reclassifying or it's going to be tough to be in the uh, rotation, especially if you go to a school like Georgia or like after Texas A&M's class, this class, or Alabama. It's tough to to play as a freshman, so you're really losing out on two things. And, uh, I mean, yeah, the nil money could be uh, an effect of that, but are you you worth, you know, losing your senior high school, your freshman year of college over – you know, six hundred thousand dollars. I I don't know. I, that's that's the thing that uh, I guess is discussed between these families or what what they need. But still, I I don't. That's not something that unless you're physically ready to take on uh, the SEC and and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't I don't see it it being an incentive to go on and and, and reclassify. No doubt. No doubt. And let's get caught up on some YouTube comments right here before we get uh, get any more vault questions. Uh, Cat Dog, he said, the Smith boys, Aaron and CJ, both have world-class speed. Is there anything in this uh, wide receiver class that we're uh, looking at with that type of elite speed? Let me answer that one. No. Uh, no one has that kind, of, that kind of speed. There's very few people in the world, I think, that have that, that kind of speed. Um, Sperlin had five TDs and 300 yards in one football game. Yeah, that's what we were saying. He could, he's he's a dynamic receiver. Um, Bobby Sagas came on here and said, we need to use tight ends like Donnan used to. So throwing out a little love to Coach Jim Donnan uh, with how he used to use tight ends. And then finally, uh, Foghorn uh, Lemon said, I'm curious what would happen and who they would chase in 2024 if Arch Manning doesn't come to Georgia and Raiola, who is currently trending towards – Trojan uh, Trojans uh, that go to Troy. So I, I, you know, I saw that today with with USC and 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 Raiola and some some picks on there from other you know organizations and stuff. I just don't. That was, that's uh, that's shocking to some people, you know, around the town of Athens. If that's if that's the case, uh, because I know that Georgia feels very very good about uh, Dylan Raiola, but you know, uh, Jed, who are some other you know, 2024 names that in that quarterback deal that people need to keep an eye out for if uh, Arch Manning doesn't come in 2023, uh, who would they kind of push the push, you know, in on in 2024 on top of Dylan Raola there? Yeah, I think you look at CJ Carr out of Michigan. He was here this weekend, uh, grandson of Lloyd Carr. Um, DJ Lagway out of Texas. He'll be in Athens next Tuesday. Julian, oh, Jaden Davis. We saw him at the Charlotte Camp too, Blaine. He's a that's I believe he's the number one quarterback in the twenty four class right now. Um, very yeah, five star very, guy. Yeah, very very. You know, looks like what a a, a franchise quarterback should look like, should look like. There's Julian Sayan out of California, uh, Jaden Bradford, IMG Academy. There's a lot of different guys um, at various levels of you know priority one A, one B, whatever. Um, but yeah, the Dylan Royola thing. It's like you said, Georgia has felt very good about him. He's been to Athens a bunch of times. Um, so I think he's shipping up to kind of be, at least from Georgia's perspective, you know, that guy that they really uh, kind of go all in on in the 24 class. And you can you can maybe throw, uh, you know, Jaden Davis up there as a 1A, as dueling 1As maybe. Yeah, and then, and then it's all irrelevant because the NCAA and ESPN are so happy with the ratings that Stetson Bennett pushes in. They find some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of legislation to give him permanent eligibility. Isn't that right, Trent? You've said he's never going to lose eligibility. Stetson Bennett, Bennett isn't. Yeah, he's here to stay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you ain't got to worry about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, all right, P- PA Dog 610, uh, your favorite questioner there, Jed, uh, uh, Pennsylvania love there. My guy, my guy. Uh, what current Georgia commit in the 23 class will become the lead recruiter of others? I've heard some good things about Pierce Sperling. Yeah, uh, I I think there's no doubt uh, for several reasons that Pierce Sperlin is kind of the heart and soul of this uh, recruiting class. One, because he grew up a Georgia fan, you know, since diapers. I mean, a diehard Georgia fan. He was in the stadium when Georgia won the national championship uh, this year. So he's kind of been through the ups and downs with the Georgia fan base because he's a Georgia guy through and through. So and and he he works extremely hard uh, all the time recruiting these guys. Another guy, uh, you know, as of late, that some people had some 
speculation about Jed was Raquez McKeldery, you know, saying, oh, well, it's inevitable that he's going to flip to Alabama. McKeldery has been doing a lot of recruiting of his own for the University of Georgia and has shown a lot of, a lot of confidence in uh, Georgia's hire, hire of Stacey Searles uh, as the new offensive line coach. Yeah, he visited a couple weekends ago. Loved, uh, you know, loved meeting with Coach Sheryls. I love. He's a very Raquez is a very outgoing, you know, kind of kind of bubbly personality guy. I love talking to him personally uh, myself. So, yeah, it's, that was one of those things where it seemed like when he committed, and then Alabama offered either a couple days before or after he committed, it kind of seemed like everyone was okay. He's going to end up in Tuscaloosa. And then when Matt Luke uh, stepped down, it kind of seemed like okay, here it comes. He's going to decommit with the coaching switch, and that hasn't happened. And now he is is still here, and like you said, he's commu- com- recruiting for um, easy for me to say for the other guys in this class. So he's another guy that you know he's he's definitely got the uh, got that recruiter personality about him. I'll I'll say that. Trent, if and we all know that if Arch Manning uh, commits, then he'll he'll recruit just by being Arch Manning. I mean that, that'll be he'll end up being the attraction in the class just for you know, the positioning of himself and the position he plays. No doubt. Uh, Arch Manning and, and even Justice Haynes uh, having those ties to Georgia, I think he would be another one. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's that, that's the key. I think I think when Georgia back, uh, you know, when they landed Jake Fromm and you landed all those guys around him, it was a – you kind of build around that that top guy and Arch Manning would be that. And if you're, if you're building around uh, a guy like Arch Manning, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of success – uh, in, in this recruiting class, but I still think even if Georgia was to not land Archman in this class, you might not land some of the uh, maybe a couple of the playmakers you're going to land, but you still got some guys that uh, uh, you know lo- love the University of Georgia or are going to take that 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 role as a, a the head recruiter, and you're still going to land some uh, talent. You know, it, Kirk, Kirby's still Kirby's still in Athens, so you're going to have a, a good class. Uh, but you know, they, it would put the I guess. Uh, icing on the cake with with arch and him leading the leading the charge absolutely and we are working through these vault questions right now go ahead and throw in some comments on youtube if you want just to to highlight anything or you got some some comments stuff like that we'd love to to hear from you on that go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the like button for us as well as we bring up a question here from colony city dogs i'll read this one off it says dogs need to sign outstanding DL each year to compete in the SEC. Can you give us a few names at the interior DL spots as well as edge spots that we stand best chance of signing? I have a, I have a, uh, I have a future cast in for Jamal Jarrett to, to Georgia. I had that in since January when he arrived uh, on campus. And sometimes there's just guys that you can tell, like when I, when I spoke to, to Sean Washington, back in August of 2021 and heard the the details of the conversations that were going on with he and Trey, uh, Trey Scott and Kirby Smart mm-hmm. and, and you know, the, the, the people on staff there and how they, they spoke about him uh, and how his, the people around Sean spoke about, about Sean and, and his relationship with George. I just knew, and I got that feeling, uh, you know, with Jamal Jarrett as well. Um, Jed, I know uh, Xavier Xavier McLeod is another guy, uh, interior uh, defensive lineman. Any other guys that, that come to mind on the uh, interior defensive front that you can think of that Georgia's really uh, stands a good chance with at, at this moment? Yeah, there's Caden McDonald, uh, another guy out of North Gwinnett. Um, then after him, um, trying to get those are the three. I mean, especially Jamal. I mean, that seems like they try to get that one big guy in the middle every year and obviously last year it looked like it's Barry alexander and this year jamal jared is shaping up to be that guy right in the middle of the defense uh vic burley is is, is kind of uh an interior guy he's a, tween, a tweener tweener yeah. yeah he's he's kind of uh interior ish more of a kind of like a three tech type uh, not necessarily over the over the center but yeah um and then i uh, Top edge guy under the sun. It seems like Georgia is, is is highly in on that now in this class between Tamarian Parker, Gabe Harris. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Kel, Kelby Collins. Kelby Collins is a guy who could be that in between guy. He's at that two eighty, two eighty five mark. So that could be a, a very interesting 
you know, pick there as well that, that they're trying to get in on. And, and uh, uh, Stefan Green out of Rome as well, an, an in, in-state guy that is very athletic, um, is still still really growing. Justin Benton, who is a, a Georgia legacy, um, there is another guy. So lots of, uh, lots of options, it seems like, here uh, for Georgia on that defensive interior. But um, Jarrett, McLeod, uh, McDonald, those are definitely some of the, the bigger names uh, that, that people need to know. And then Jordan Big Baby Hall is, is someone who that Georgia is going to battle with Florida State and some of those other schools in the in the uh, state of Florida for. But, you know, he's someone that, that Carson Hall, who is a, 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 I think, a quality control and defensive um, staff for, for Georgia there is recruiting hard. And, of course, uh, of course, you know, Trey Scott is as well. So those are some of the names that you would know there. And then, of course, the mysterious seven cloud is uh, committed right now to, to, to Georgia still Jed. So uh, we, we never know what's going to happen with old uh, seven over there. So that, that's uh that's interesting, interesting stuff. Looking forward to seeing seven actually get to get to play some ball this, this fall. It'll be, uh, be good to see. All right, Jed, we got one from what's up dog there. What's up, dog, with uh, this week's Arch Manning question sponsored by, I don't know, somebody. Uh, if you had to bet the mortgage on Arch Manning's choice, would it be Georgia or Texas? I mean, uh, and I'm, so and, and definitely an amount of money you're having to wager that matters to your family here. Uh, I think I, I, I say Arch Manning, and that's not me being a – uh, someone here on UGA Sports trying to provide, uh, you know, false hope or trying to blow smoke or anything like that. I just think that that when you look at every factor and you look at what matters to the Manning family, I do not see how Texas has any clear advantage over Georgia unless it were to come down to pure nil, just back up the Brinks truck type package, and I just unless I'm totally mis miscalculating what's important to the, the Manning family, Trent, I don't see that being the determining factor in this recruitment. No, I don't either. I, I, you know, I still think uh, I like Georgia's chances for Arch. I've liked Georgia's chances since, I guess, back in the fall. Um, no, I haven't put in a, a future cast for uh, him to go to Georgia yet, but, uh, you know, because we still know a decision is not – uh, going to happen here in the next month or so, but um, you know, they're still doing their homework and stuff, but I, I still like Georgia's chances there. And um, you know, it, it's not going to come down to who rolls out the bank for him. Um, like you said, is is this is a strictly business decision. And, uh, and now I like where, I like where Georgia stands. I like the relationships there. I like, uh, I know the Manning family likes, you know, how, how Georgia does things around the program, how, uh, the college experience will be uh, at Georgia, and you know I like where I like where Georgia stands. That is a key term when it comes to the Manning family and those close to the Manning family. The overall college experience, and Jed, you know, we heard firsthand from people that were actually in Athens that weekend. It was it was Gunnar Stockton, it was Brock Bowers, it was all these guys that were taking Arch Manning around and. I think that says a lot about Gunnar Stockton as a young man too, because he knows that this is a guy here that you know this is football royalty, and you're a guy from Tiger, Georgia that's grown up loving Georgia all your life. You had an opportunity to come in there and compete and play, and you're showing around the guy that could easily be coming to to you know come for potentially your spot, depending on what happens at Georgia before Arch gets there. So uh, I think that's interesting one in itself, but the college experience and the the experience of Athens, not only in this last visit, but before I think has really something that has endeared itself to the Manning family. When you talk about the classic city and the university of Georgia. Yeah, I'm sure Arch uh, had the complete college experience um, on his latest visit to Athens, but yeah. And you know, another thing too, I was thinking about today, when you look at Georgia as a program, Kirby smarts entering year, what's. Jed. But stable <laughs> coaching Jed, staff. You, you froze Sunday. for a second. We got a good. We got to clip that up for social media because we uh, that we we got a great facial expression there. But if you could nice. re re go nice. with your uh, thought thought process there. And he's frozen. You know, Georgia again. has 
<laughs> You're good we're now. Back. We're gonna we're, we're gonna back. move. I think we're gonna move on yeah. from that, Jed. I, I think you have some kind of secret on Arch Manning, and the internet does not want you to spill it right now. So we're gonna we're gonna tuck that yeah. away in our back in our in our back pocket there. Uh, Jed, we got another question there. If if the internet doesn't trip you up on that one, yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, what is the hardest position to evaluate? And then second question, without naming without naming names, have you ever seen Georgia under Kirby Smart extend an offer to a player that you didn't feel had SEC potential? Oh, I know Trent knows one, but we can't. <laughs> there was there was one. Uh, we're not going to name names, but there was one last cycle that Trent in our group chat was like, "What the heck is just Georgia seeing this guy?" And uh, if there was if there was anyone, he didn't that, sign that, with Georgia. He did <laughs> yeah, not. No, he he did, not. did not sign with Georgia. No, he did not. He was heavily recruited by Georgia by all indications. He got, so, he got the college and, experience in Athens. Got the college know. experience when, and you know, uh, you man, if we could charge, we could charge some uh, some extra dollar bucks there to uh, <laughs> be able to <laughs> let people see the the group chat on some of the, some of these guys. But for sure, I mean, it, it happens, and and that's that's the thing is that's hey, we're where where we're at, there where they're at. There's evaluations, and and everybody has their own opinions. That's the that's the great thing about it. That's what I tell people. Lord knows that I had an opposite feeling uh, on, and I'll just say I I did I had a little bit of a dust up with some of the people on the vault about not that that Gunnar Stockton is not a great player, but that he's just the the varying degrees of how people think about certain things. Some people think he's like a come you know plug and play right away type guy uh, in Athens, and I think he's much like a Brock. Vandergriff and things like that who are going to have to take their time to to develop and become that college player. So there's variance of difference uh, when it comes to some of these opinions. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's very interesting to see. But I think that quarterback position, in my opinion, Trent, may be the hardest uh, evalu- to evaluate. And the reason for it is, is because all of these guys are so well coached now. They have trainers from 10 years old up or younger that, that are, you know, working with them on mechanics and things like that. So everybody looks good when you go and see them, you know, at the quarterback position, but there's small intangibles and things that you have to like see into the soul of somebody that, that of how they are going to be able to withstand things when the bullets are flying. Yeah, definitely. I think quarterback's hard. Uh, and I also think offense line is, is tough because, I mean, you still got guys growing, and and, and one guy that I, I keep going back to is a 24 guy is Jimothy Lewis out of Mississippi who never played football until I think his freshman year. And coming into his freshman year, he was 5'11", and now he's 6'7". And uh, so it, it's all about, you know, it, the, the growth and, and, and all that stuff. And and now he's – I think he's the number one offensive lineman in Mississippi in 24 class. So – I think offensive line and uh, quarterback, like you touched on, is it, uh, those are two hard positions. Kirby's advisor is telling us right here, Arch Manning has a Twitter now. Uh, so, yeah, I saw that today. Ruben Owens put it on there that he's got a got a Twitter account. And he's, you know, you know that you got some stroke when you make your Twitter account and are immediately verified. Uh, so, so uh, it came up there. It was a, it was not a, you know, wait a couple hours. He, he came in with the blue check. So he's knocking that, knocking that door down immediately and that's going to make paul Mahari so mad by the way <laughs> uh, paul arch comes in arch arch just signs up for an account he's verified paul's been trying to get verified for a while and by the way twitter if you're listening to twitter what the heck are you not doing verifying our guy paul hey I mean, if paul if paul changed his name to paul manning he might get it that's it. That's it. He, Paul, Archie's cousin, just put that on the on the bio or something like that. That'd be uh, be great. But uh, he, he, Bobby Saga says Stockton's probably better than Bennett right now. Agree to disagree. We'll we'll uh, we'll move on from from that point. I think uh, I think Stockton is a great athlete. He's just going to have to develop like all these guys do. It's, it's a difference in going to play from you know, single A and double A ball to, that's to the, the SEC. That's the one thing that a lot of people don't see is, is if you're looking at a pure quarterback, Stockton, Vandegrift, Beck, all of those are better quarterbacks than Stockton. I mean, just from a pure talent standpoint. Yeah, a uh, vacuum. But but you also have to take in the mentality. Uh, and, 
we, we saw that when, you know, Carson Beck was going to be the quarterback uh, after, um, uh, you know, when, when the injuries happened and, and Carson Beck was going to be the quarterback and then he, he could not do it uh, mentally at that time. And, uh, and, and that's when, you know, you brought in uh, – and and that's what he has over the other ones right now. Um, he has the the savvy. He he know he knows he's going to go out there and, and he's going to do it. And and, and and you know I'm not sure the other ones have that uh, mentality to do that just yet. Yeah, it, it borders it borderline. It's borderline. Uh, it's borderline foolishness almost as as much confidence as Stetson Bennett has. Right, like it's a, it's borderline on being overconfident. Um, but if Stetson Bennett came out right now and went to the NFL, he would have no doubt in his mind that he was going to be a first round pick. I mean, that's yeah. just the mentality he has as a quarterback. You know, he doesn't have he's five ten. You know, if you stretch him out a little bit or he grows his hair a little bit, but he has it. You know, between the ears, and uh, that that's what it takes a lot of times. Yeah. So it it, it and the thousands and thousands of reps. I mean, thousands upon thousands of reps advantage that he has on those other guys, even on Carson Beck is uh, something that is, uh, you know, that, that can't be undervalued as well. So I think that's a, that's an interesting deal. If anybody has any questions on uh, the, on YouTube, throw those in the comments. We're going to uh, try to answer a few more before we sign off here. Um, but that's what this is all about, guys. We we enjoy this community of the vault, and that's what you're missing out uh, on if you're not a member of the UGA Sports Vault. It's because, I mean, there's so many varying opinions, and recruiting never stops, and that's, that's the great thing about it. So uh, we really, really enjoy everybody coming on. Um, keep, keep up with, keep up with recruiting. Uh, I don't, I don't, oh, that's what he, uh, he was answering phenom unit asking why does anyone have a twitter anymore they said it's a it's a cesspool yeah twitter sometimes i wish i didn't have to see some of the stuff that was on twitter for sure but you have to have it if you're going to keep up with uh, the recruiting in today's time jed you said you were you, were you gonna say something on that you look like you had had something to say about I twitter say, if i didn't have twitter I'd, I'd never know uh i'd never know about the will smith and uh, chris rock thing last night I didn't watch yeah. so you know how how could i have lived my life today not knowing that two millionaires that one millionaire smacked another one last night like i just i don't know how i could have how i could have functioned and done my job today if if i had known that so well, speak speaking of that while we're on this topic with uh we're gonna try to let a couple of vault questions you know trickle in here a lot of people they, i've seen it both ways i've seen people respect chris rock so much because he was able to keep on going with it but i was almost like how do how does how do you not fight that man right there on the stage? Like if someone comes in and slaps you in the face, how do you not fight that man right there? Like I don't know that there would have to be some kind of retaliation. Yeah, if like if you're gonna make the argument that it was staged or scripted or whatever, like that's your best argument is that this is a grown man that just smacked you and you don't do anything but laugh and 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 continue with the show. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it was scripted or not. I mean, I don't watch. I, 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 I've never made a habit of watching award shows or anything like that. Because one, I don't know any of the movies that win the awards. So, uh, what's the point? I'm not cultured enough. Um, but I don't. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm sure there will be. My favorite uh, a tweet I saw about it was there was a tweet saying there's going to be all these, uh, you know, think pieces about what this slap actually means in our culture. And then the guy responded with a picture of like why the Will Smith slap has no place while there's a war in Ukraine going on. And yeah. um, this is, this is, see, we're, we're just, we're so trying now to you're connecting dots that, yeah, that don't connect anywhere. So. Yeah, exactly. So if it wasn't scripted, rock played it off really well. Very yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or he was, was just so shocked that he had no idea uh, what was going but, on. I mean, but you kind of see when he, when he was walking up there, he kind of just kind of poked out his face and he was like, exactly. just slap me. I mean, like, I don't know what you're about to do, but I'm just about to it's take almost it. like he was leaning in to like hear he thought he was gonna like come say something to him, you know. He's like, I'm gonna lean in and say something, but it's always uh it's interesting to see um you know it's interesting to to see all the reactions from today. If one thing it did, it provided some hilarious sports memes. So uh, but on that note, guys, I, I see we don't have any more YouTube questions here that I can that I can see. Um, but 
you know, a great episode of Rumors versus Facts. We'll be back next Monday to talk more about Georgia football recruiting. So, as always, make sure to subscribe, like, follow us on Twitter, all that good stuff. And we will catch you next time on UGA Sports Rumors versus Facts.